A Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for A Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Good evening and welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. My name is Paul John Dykes and I'm delighted this evening to be chatting to Saul Davis from the band James. We all own a James record and Saul will be talking to us this evening about his career within that band. Also, his love of football and an initiative which he is involved in that we need to be aware of. Everybody Belongs Here. That's the website of this anti-racist initiative that Saul has set up and we want to raise awareness of that tonight. We'll be talking about that initiative, his career in music and his love of football in just a few moments. This has been made possible by our hosts, Celts are here. Thank you very much, guys. And the whole show will be produced by The Longest 40, who are a fantastic promotions company and who have provided loads of free events such as this during the lockdown throughout the the pandemic. I'm a massive James fan. I can't wait to hear from Saul. So please, welcome to A Celtic State of Mind, Saul Davis. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Yeah, really well. Thanks for having me on. Obviously, amazing, actually. It's an absolute pleasure. First thing I'm going to say is, I love that T-shirt. Talk to me about that T-shirt, Saul. Uh, this, this this very nice T-shirt that I'm modelling here. Look at this. There you go. Yeah. No, it is a pretty cool T-shirt. This, this is a, a design that was made by uh, Kerry Roper, who is one of the head designers at Saatchi & Saatchi, who you mentioned this, Everybody Belongs Here, which is, I mean, this is a fun, amazing opportunity for me to talk to people about what we're doing. So I really want to thank you for, for you know giving me the platform to talk about that and other things and have a chat with you generally about all sorts of stuff, obviously. But, um, yeah, Kerry, I, we... Um, he, he did this design. He's a member of this team that has been put together, Saatchi and Saatchi. You will know that name. They're, you know, a massive company, you know, whatever, do some amazing work. And uh, they're giving their time for free. So they're very much the engine behind what we're doing, along actually with Porto Football Club, who have also given us a huge amount of support. And, um, yeah, we had these T-shirts on. We've been giving them out to people. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking great. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the message that we have, you know, um, I think it's bold, and it and it and it's you know there's there's no mistake in it. Is that look at it? Do you know what I mean? It's looking good. So, what I would say is, I was on the website today, and those t-shirts are available for purchase on uh, everybodybelongshere.com. We're talking about the initiative. Tell us more about it. You mentioned Porto was involved. For anyone who hasn't seen what you did with Porto, talk us through that as well. So, yeah. So, well, I'll give you a wee brief history then of this, really. So, um, first of all, I, you know, you know, I'd like to say, you know, this is very much an initiative that is. Uh, it's not a James initiative, you know, that, you know, um, this is not about really about, you know, my band as such, our band, you know, it, it's, um, but it's definitely, uh, it, it really came about with, from three lines of text from a song, um, actually, which is on our, on a, a record that we made uh, quite recently. And um, the song is called Many Faces. And um, uh, we, we, we toured quite extensively, um, you know, around the world, whatever. And, um, um, and every night we, we were playing this song and um, what we were finding was, you know, get to the end section of this uh, um, 
uh, tune. It was a big kind of typical James kind of sing along, you know, and uh, words uh, written by Tim, our singer. Um, and uh, it's very simple. It's just um, there's only one human race, many faces. Everybody belongs here. And Tim, I know, had kind of written those words. Um, I think partly imagining himself actually standing directly in front of Donald Trump. And it was really a message to Trump, actually, uh, from Tim. Um, uh, actually, we got to play on the White House lawn once, many, many years ago. Um, uh, not when Trump was in power, obviously, many years ago, but it was, uh, it was an amazing experience. We did a benefit gig for uh, Greenpeace um, mm -hmm. and uh, on, the, on the White House lawn. So momentarily, the White House was grounds were kind of full of hippies and nutters and musicians kind of running around, you know, like whatever is magic. Um, uh, he, he would have allowed us in. I don't think he would have thought of us maybe as a bit, a bit too much of a threat. But um, so, yeah, that, that was the closest we ever got to the Oval Office. But anyway, this as a digression. Um, uh, yeah, Tim, uh, you know, had, had this idea in his head. This record that that song came from is a very uh, politically charged record. Tim lives yeah. in America and he saw the wind blowing in the direction probably that it's that it's blown in. Uh, yeah. You know, over the last few years. And um, uh, the opening song of that album has the line, white fascists in the White House. Um, uh, he sings about Trump's crackhead tiny fingers and all the rest of it. So it was a brutal attack on mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. regime. You, you can think of it as a regime in a way. Anyway, we played this song a lot on uh, a tour that we did last year, uh, last summer, throughout the summer in America. And my partner, Vanda, was on, uh, was on that to her for quite a bit of it and um, she um, witnessed the kind of engagement with the crowd and like you know night after night the crowd would kind of run with the tune and take it up themselves and we kind of left be standing there slightly redundant on the stage which is a feeling that I've got used to quite a lot in my career do you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> then and what, a cup of tea I'll just I'll just go and and um, that's what happens when you write sing-along anthems you know you might yeah. as well just not bother you just you know what I mean so anyway um, and we, we got back to we got back to Europe and um, uh, we we, we, had, we did a gig in Madrid and then we went to play in Porto. It turns out actually that that's been now the last show that we've that we that we did. In fact, yeah. um, last September, and we, and we recorded the, we recorded the show and uh, it was a magic 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 night. Uh, I know Porto very well because I, I lived there. My son was born there and uh, and I have a Portuguese family and and all the rest of it. So. Uh, and I have a great respect and love of the city and uh, and its people, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I always, people said to me, what's, people in Scotland said to me, what's Porto like? And I said, it's like Glasgow in the sun. There's lots of similarities. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's industrial to some extent. It has a massive history to do with the sea and the river and the, the you know, the, industry that comes with all that stuff obviously in Porto it's slightly different it's the port wine coming down from the river rather than shipbuilding say or whatever in Glasgow but it but there's a history to do with the river in the rest of the country the inland you know obviously Glasgow has that being on the west coast just like Porto is uh, it's got you know the river splits the city in half like it does it's the center of a lot of music that comes out of Portugal a lot of great music comes out of the north um it's got a great football team um like Glasgow has um um and and it uh, it, and it, it, it's essentially working class, uh, but it's also very artistic, um, and it's a challenging place. It's had its dark moments, like Glasgow has as well. Um, uh, but it, by the people that like it, by the people that get it, it's a city uh, that's easy to love and enjoy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so it really is like Glasgow in the sun. Um, you know, it probably uh, if if it rains 350 days of the year in Glasgow. It rains like five days of the year in Porto. And if the average temperature in Glasgow is like six degrees, then it's like 26 in Porto. So, you know, it's just, it's, <laughs> there are some, look at the football, look at the style of football that gets played in the two, in the two yeah. cities as well. It's funny. But um, no, so we, we uh, I'd invited some of the Porto uh, hierarchy as such to come to our gig. I knew they were James fans. And we did this big blinding show in a park. Um, it was huge. Uh, you know, whole place was rammed. It was amazing, and we had a mad stage invasion, and uh, they all got on the stage. There must have been literally about hundred people on the stage uh, singing this song. It was mad. 
uh, beautiful. I really thought the stage was going to collapse, actually. But anyway, um, and we, we got through the night. And, uh, well, we, we went to the club. Uh, Vanda said, well, you know, you, you, you go to the club. Talk to them about getting involved, you know. So I went. Yeah. And um, they were uh, hugely receptive. Having been at the show themselves and having witnessed this kind of takeover of the state and the emotion, you know, music is a, a vehicle, I always think, for emotion. You know, and um, and football is a vehicle in a way for emotion. And football is an expression of emotion, uh, and so is music, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, the real highs in your life, um, they're often for football fans. Those real highs are often associated with football. Um, it's why some it's why some people who don't like football wonder why it is that people get so hit up about it. Well, it's just it's in you, you know, and and music is the same. Um, you know, and and uh, like an amazing, like a great football team, um, you don't know what's going to happen, and, and that's that's the thing about bands, great bands. I think are bands where you go, you can go night after night and see the band play, and you don't know what you're going to get. You know, you don't know whether it's going to collapse or whether it's mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be one of those magic nights. You know, we are certainly a band. We're lucky we've been going for so long. You know, I mean, we were invented before electricity. You know that, don't you? So <laughs> we've been going so long that. Um, you know, we have a catalogue, so we can, you know, we literally, I mean, Jimmy started this band in 1981, okay, so, you know, that that's like, that's when things were, that's when the football was in black and white, you know what I mean? So, it's like, we, we have this unbelievable catalogue of songs that we can pull into a, to a set, and one of the reasons why I think we're still playing to big numbers of people, making new records and all the rest of it, is because we are, because uh, we don't rehearse, and we change our set all the time, so people come to our gigs and they don't know what they're going to get, and it's magic, you know, it can be magic, you know, it can also fail as well. It would be great, so, for these people that come to gig after gig after gig, if you're mixing it up. Yeah, well, uh, Jimmy often says, actually, uh, we go to every gig, we have to be there, apart from me making tea sometimes, um, we have to be, the band members need to be at every single gig, so if we don't make it vital for ourselves, um, which means mixing it up, then we'll get stale. We'll become a greatest hit. We, we've had some big tunes. We could do a greatest hit set and everybody would love it. And very occasionally, you know, we, we err towards that. Do you know what I mean? We do a big Christmas show or whatever. Well, we know why we're there. That's cool. It's a party. But the rest of the time, um, the amazing thing is that the majority of our fans want us to challenge them, you know, and they, they, they want us to make new records and they want to hear those records played. I think for a lot of bands, we, that's really unusual situation to be in and uh, we're very fortunate and we're really unbelievably grateful. We don't have a lot of opportunity, so at the moment we don't have very much opportunity to say thank you to people for that for that support. But I think at the moment it means even more than ever and I'm not paying lip service to that like some cloying kind of aging rock star, you know, is kind of pretending to say thanks to his fans. I'm not doing that. It's like I, I genuinely get it, do you know what I mean? And I think um, we're in a time when people being transparent and honest with each other and being able to say things that support each other is, is amazing. You know, it's great. It, it's You know, uh, there's a lot of very dark things going on in the world. But on the other yeah. hand, yeah. there's also some really good things happening where people are being honest with each other and saying things that perhaps they wouldn't have said otherwise. And I think that's quite great. That's great. You know, whatever. Um, anyway, back to Porto. We went to them and they said, yeah, what can we do to help? And we will do something with you. So we planned with them a bit and it ended up... Um, uh, 17th of January, uh, they gave us their stadium. Uh, it was a home match against Braga. Um, again, it was a really hardcore game. It was a difficult game. Braga are a great, great team. They play great football, and obviously, it's a local rivalry. You know, it would be like Celtic Kilmarnock, say, in distance or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so Celtic, Hibs, Hearts, maybe something. You know, like that. Um, a lot of rivalry, a lot of history between the clubs. And um, so actually Porto lost. They, they missed two penalties as well during the game. It was mad. Um, but just before the game, we got on the pitch. Um, uh, me, uh, Jimmy came, people, and a lot of people, uh, art, local artists and musicians from Porto, from Portugal, who wanted to support us. Uh, people who had affiliation with the club, people who did not also. And they let us all, this ragtag bunch on the pitch, in the middle of the pitch, and we got the whole crowd singing along to the tune. Um, just that refrain ran around. There's only one human race, many faces. Everybody belongs here. And we sang it in sound. We filmed it. And after that, we made a, made a little video and we started sharing that a little bit. And it went a bit mad in Portugal. People really responded to it. 
it was quite amazing. We got messages from other teams saying that they really enjoyed the activity that we'd done. And so we started working on, then we took it to Saatchi and Saatchi in London and said, look, we need some help. How, how can you help us? And they loved it and they wanted to get involved. So they've given us this massive team of people, um, uh, quite amazing people really, uh, and um, a very diverse bunch of people that come from different backgrounds, different social uh, means, whatever, people who, like Kerry, who well publicized, was employed pretty much with a, with some dark uh, days in his life, he was essentially sectioned when he was employed by them, uh, uh, with with some issues surrounding mental health. All sorts of people uh, in that building uh, who want to try and make a difference. And I have absolutely no problem in saying that they're amazing people. And really, again, thank you to them because um, it's not every day that you see a, a corporate entity as they are deciding for no particular reason other than the fact that they want to and think there's value in it, just deciding to help, you know, a bunch of halfwits like me um, <laughs> try to get something off the ground, you know. So it's pretty amazing. And, um, yeah, fair dues to them, really. So we've made some beautiful things and we've started talking to some fantastic people, some football people and some music people, people starting now to send us little messages in, um, uh, and uh, people like Gordon Strachan, um, Simon Donnelly, uh, uh, Carlos Carvajal, a Portuguese uh, manager who managed uh, at Swansea and in Sheffield Wednesday, Besiktas in Turkey, um, all sorts of people coming our way. And um, it's it's brilliant. Uh, Nuno Valente in Portugal as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're just growing. We're just starting. Um, we're focusing in now on what we want to say to people and how the best way to say that is. And, um, you know, I think ideally what we'd like to do, our, our, our initiative is based around the idea. What we had seen last year um, in world football was the resurgence of some very uh, nasty, uh, racist uh, abuse um, being aimed. Uh, well, it seemed quite indiscriminate. You know, we, we we saw it in Spain, in Italy. The England national team got abused in Hungary. Um, I thought that was particularly galling because regardless of what people in Scotland might think of the England national team, and I know what they think of the England national team, as someone who lives in Scotland, I know exactly what people say about the England national team. But what everybody agrees is that regardless of what show what colour of shirt you're wearing, the colour of your skin should have absolutely no bearing on how you're treated on or off the pitch. Yeah. And um, uh, I thought that Southgate dealt with it unbelievably brilliantly by taking his players in the middle of the pitch and having a conversation with them in the middle of that game. Mm-hmm. And, if, and, and the bravery of those players to play on, really. Um, there were young players in that team. You know, they're, they're guys who are 19 or 20 years old who uh, would have quite rightly expected that um, that kind of abuse would be not something that they would now have to uh, endure in their professional life. You know, and it's one thing in your social life if you get into a situation out there in the world where something mad happens. But we're in our, in our professional lives, I'm not saying that's right at all, but you get what I'm saying here. In our professional lives, there's no play, you know, we, we must show uh, respect. And uh, that that was sadly and totally lacking in that particular mm-hmm. instance. Mm-hmm. Made worse, of course, by uh, the president of the Hungarian Football Association saying, "I don't really know what the problem is. England are making it up," and uh, you know, and you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm English. I was born in Liverpool, but I spent a lot of my life living in Scotland. And uh, when it comes down to Scotland playing England at the football, I'm afraid to say that I'm, I, I suddenly become a Scot. <laughs> and uh, me, me and my family went to the uh, um, when Gordon Strachan was the manager of Scotland. Um, uh, he very graciously uh, invited me to go with my family to the Scotland England match at Hampden, uh, and I couldn't believe that I was going to a Scotland England match right I just thought I'd never I'd never experienced that right my dad had because in the 70s when we lived in uh in near Stirling uh, uh he went I can't remember what year it is but he went 
when England, I think it was maybe 76, England beat Scotland. It was Alan Ball scored the goal. It was 1-0. And my dad, I can't, can you believe this, went there with an England scarf on, right? <laughs> and it was 100,000 more or less Scots and my dad. And they really was the days when you would go to an England, a Scotland-England match at Hampden and there would be like 97,000 Scots and three English fans, like three, who were just kind of like there by mistake. You know what I mean? They were Maybe they were trying to go, I don't know what to, like Blair Drummond Safari Park, but ended up in Hampden. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and my dad got it. And this is the mad thing. So a load of bricks came flying down from the, 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 the stand above, right? But of course... This is not an exact science throwing a brick in a football match. So I think my dad was unscathed, but obviously a few of the nutters around him got battered, you know, by their, by their own fans. You know? and, it's like, and I remember him coming back and going, that was mental. You know? That's what we call the good old days in the game. Eh? The, the good old days, yeah. The thing is, so we had a very interesting discussion just last week about the good old days, about the 1970s, and how your parents took you to Celtic Park. What was your memories back then, you know, the jungle at Celtic Park in the 1970s? Well, I mean, we, we there's no, there's nothing like that in the, you know, there's nothing like that in, well, maybe now, still in Argentina, maybe uh, Boca Juniors against uh, what they called, uh, what would it be, their, their big rivals, whatever they are, right? And that, that, you know what I mean? Like, that would be maybe because there's still cages, because there's still terracing, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, for people, you know, I'm about to be 55, so, you know, I fall into the category of people that could have, you know, could, could go to football in the 70s. You know, young mm-hmm. lads went to football in the 70s. Whatever. But there's no experience that you can have like that now in Europe. There's, it doesn't exist. You know, you can't, that's gone. You know, that, the, 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 the aggression, actually, even, as well. I mean, that's the thing, you know, the raw, vital power of those events you know maybe going to an amazing maybe i don't know uh going to see a biffy glyro gig you know in the barras say yeah you're one of the two thousand that got a ticket maybe that would be do you know what i mean like being at the Mm -hmm. front that might be akin to it but but i mean it's you know that's really amazing those events you know and, and that's a part of the history of scotland the history of football uh you know, that, that's kind of gone, you know, so you're left with a fading memory. You, you're left with some YouTube clips and some old players and people who were old enough to go on occasion. You know, we didn't go a lot, but we went on occasion. I mean, they're fright is frightening. You know what I mean? It's supercharged. Like you're not, you know, um, I think it was one of those matches. My, my, my whole family, well, the whole family went and my, 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 you know, my parents were music loving weirdo, essentially weirdo hippie types really like you know there was a period of time when I used to have to milk our goats before going to school and at school I was called the gay goat right because I was English so I was gay obviously and I was milking goats and you know goat, goats are very nutty the smell of them so they you know I was called the gay goat you know it's like it's pretty funny really they could be so cruel so well may, maybe I don't I, I didn't I, the thing is you brush that off because that's not that you know that wasn't that Serious, um, but um, yeah. But anyway, that that was just a way of demonstrating that you know we, we did some mad stuff. You know what I mean? So yeah, they, they took. We, we all went on mass. But I, I have a brother. He, he he has some learning difficulties. So you you know to take a, a kid like him to Parkhead in a match like that um, is ridiculous. So yeah, and uh, brilliant. And uh, and my mum got lost. And I remember the the, the PA system barking out. Well, my sister Davies plays it. I hang a hoot in it. And you go, that's mum. Where is she? Well, my sister Davies plays it. And you're like, we lost mum. Mad. Brilliant. Brilliant. Magic. <laughs> so we found her again. So that's that's good. <laughs> you've, you've mentioned Gordon Strachan a couple of times, so. And I, incredibly enough, was introduced to your initiative via Gordon. Just it was just a random conversation I had with him in January, and he was singing your song, and he was telling me all about the work he had done with Porto that month. This was at the, at the end of January, and it was only then, believe it or not, obviously a fan of Celtic, a fan of the band. It was only then that I became aware of Gordon's friendship with Tim, 
Now, how did that develop? Was that an early 90s thing? And did Tim get in touch with Gordon when he was at Leeds United? How did that work? Yeah, I think their friendship comes from the time, because Leeds, because uh, um, uh, Tim's a Leeds fan, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that's where that, that's where that connection came from. And um, uh, Gordon started coming to, you know, some James gigs and uh, and he really got it. And we'll often, more often than not, we'll, um, his wife Leslie will come along as well. And she's a, a lovely woman. And, and um, yeah, he, he would um, come and help himself to a little glass of wine and a, and a, and a bag of peanuts um, in the dressing room. So by the time we came off stage, there was nothing left. And there was just Gordon in a state of undress in our, in our dressing room. <laughs> no, Gordon, no, sorry. sorry. Uh, no, he's a, he's a huge music fan. And... Um, and it's brilliant. He loves the shows. He loves it. And what I think is amazing about Gordon is um, he, he gets the he gets what we're doing. You know, he really gets what we're doing as a band. And going back to the thing about James, you know, changing things around again, failing sometimes, and sometimes hitting real highs. I'm sh- I'm sure that you know, uh, Gordon is a is a is a very very good football manager. You know, mm-hmm. um, and like all very good football managers, uh, gets flack from time to time because. When you when you when you're good at it, you create expectations that you that you that you can only succeed. And of course, you know you can't always succeed. You know you're going you're going to fail sometimes. Going back to that game at Hamden against England, mm-hmm. I knew England were going to score in the last twenty seconds of that game. I knew it. I absolutely knew that Kane was going to score, and I actually turned my back and just put my hand over my eyes and went, "No, nah, it, it's." And they did. And as I turned around and looked at it, I just saw Gordon with a bottle of water. I just go bang, and throw this bottle of water on the side of the pitch. And I, I subsequently asked him, I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying that. I said, you know, is, well, I think that might have gone down as the worst moment in his career. You know, mm-hmm. that's how close you are to, you know, beating the team in front of you it happens to be England with all that comes with that and potentially progressing into the fight. You know, that would have given Scotland away a fighting chance, you know, to get to those finals. So the margins, you know, people always say this, yeah, whatever. It's not over till they get into the final whistle. It's fine margins, whatever. But, but it's true, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? So The thing with Gordon um, that you also told me is that you were the guest of him at Rugby Park back in 2007. And that's when Celtic uh, wrapped up the league title. You and the band were all in amongst the Celtic fans that day. Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was one of the best experiences of my life, I'll tell you, which, which was... <laughs> which is some call because um, he'd uh, he said, yeah, right, you can get into the game. And we were like, we were doing a gig either the day the day before or the day after, whatever. So we had a day off and it just so coinc- it just so happened to coincide with that game. And so we went along to the, all of us went along. And there's, a, you know, the people in the back, they're not, work, they're not used to going to the football. And the funny thing is as well that Mark, our keyboard player, and Andy, our trumpet player, they go, they go well, uh, Mark's a season ticket holder at, at the Arsenal, right? And Andy goes to the Arsenal as well quite a bit whenever he can. So, um, which isn't that often because the tickets are so highly priced, right? Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, those boys were like, you can imagine, right? We, we thought we were going to get a box and like get some little sausages on sticks and Gordon was going to sort us out and it was going to be magic and, you know, there'd be a little a little tonics at half time and maybe a little pot of tea and all the rest of it. So we go, we get our tickets and we go, right, where's the box? We realise, we walk around the ground, right? And, you, you know, you, you know Rugby Park, so we're, we're like, and we go, oh, we're in there, right, we're in the queue, right, okay, right, well, we're in the queue, right, we'll see what happens. So we re- we're in with the nutters, right? It was magic, absolutely magic, I tell you. The noise, the vibe. I saw a guy try to force a police horse to drink vodka, which is seriously one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Literally saying to the horse, to the horse, go on, take a drink, go on, take a drink, like this. And the policeman on the horse is about eight feet up in the air, just going, saying to the guy, get away from the horse. Get away, like, you know, basically, get away from the horse. <laughs> so every, I mean, this is a game that kicked off, I think, at quarter past 12, or something, half past 12. You know, the idea being, oh, I'll be all right, because everybody will get up, they'll have a nice fried breakfast, and they'll all wander along to the game, and everything will be hunky-dory. But they've all stayed up all night. I saw some fairly strange things. I saw uh, the famous Killy Pie, loads of them, tens of them, raining down on the pitch. 
from from above, which is I was like, they, they need to be eaten, lads. You know, they're not cheap. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I heard some of the foulest language I've ever heard in my life uh, coming out of the mouths of children, uh, which was magic. Um, and when Nakamura hit, it, we were at the other end to the Nakamura goal at the other. When that ball hit the back of the net, I, honestly, shaking like. It, Amazing, you know, like to be in that, to be, it's like, wow, what a feeling, what a feeling. The people who don't get football just need one little moment like that where they go, I get it now. I know, okay. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. You mentioned it before, so when it comes to football and music and the working classes, it was often the only escapism that we had. And you get that because you're a football fan, but you also give that every night you're on stage with your band. So there's this correlation with music and Celtic, music and football. We like to think of Celtic fans that all the cool bands support Celtic. Did anybody spot you guys behind the goals that day? Yeah, of course. And um, yeah, you know, it's it, it's like, oh, it's the last from Jane. Ah. Oh. You know, and of course, sit down. You know, of course, it's, it's, of course, you know, why wouldn't you? If I was one of them and I saw me, I would be doing it. Do you know, I mean, why not? It's too good an opportunity to miss. There was another game, actually. There was a game at uh, Wembley, which is a, a friendly game between England and Scotland, when, uh, which England won 3 2, which Gordon invited me and Tim and I think Jimmy along to. We went, to that. and again, he put us in with the Tartan Army, right? And Tim had never seen anything like it. I mean, you seen it on the telly or whatever. But we, you know, there we were with the loons again, uh, showing us their arses. And they got hold of the fact, and they were like, oh, "It's Tim Booth for James." Ah, oh, and, and the whole st- oh, sir, uh, oh, you know, it's like mad, brilliant, <laughs> amazing. Because they're funny as well. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're not going to harm anybody. The, the vibe is just like it's got to be a celebration. That's the connection, I think. You know, football at its best when football is ugly, when football is violent, when it's used as a uh, as a weapon, you know, uh, and when it's not controlled properly. You know, I don't mean controlled by the police or by authority or whatever, but when it doesn't control itself, when it doesn't know what it's doing, why it doesn't, when it doesn't know why it's there or what it represents or what it should be doing, you know, then, then you're in trouble. But, and football has a history of that, you know, in various countries, you know, whatever. Um, and still ongoing. That's that's what everybody belongs here is about. That's why the, mm-hmm. that's why this initiative is is. We think it's a good message in football. That there are lots of things going on at the moment. There's a huge amount of change going on out in the world. You know, people quite correctly standing up and saying we've had enough. Um, uh, but but you know, again, just going back to the initiative. You know, you know, uh, the impetus that comes from those three lines. You know, of words. Everybody. You know, there's only one human race. Many faces. Everybody belongs here. If you think about that message in terms of a football crowd, that's a positive message in a football stadium. You know, and it's limited. You know, for me, it's limited. The football stadium. It's about football, and it's about the the, the machinery of football. You know, it's about it's tackling to some extent also, um, not just prejudices, but some. You know, we there's also some corruption in football. There's there, there are there are. There are questionable things that take place in football. There would be. It's one of the, the biggest businesses on the planet. So where you have big business, you you can have, can't you? Uh, you know, some corrupt activity. Um, and so, of course, football has some issues um, to address. And uh, we we won't change very much, I'm sure. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, but 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 we but we would like to be part of the conversation. And, and, you know, we're we're enthusiastic football supporters. You know, we love football as well. So we have a huge passion for football. And we see, like you do, you know, the connection between football and the jobs that, you know, well, at the moment we can't do. You know, no one's really, you know, everybody's in limbo. You know, uh, we we would be doing shows this summer. You know, we had some shows booked to go and play, but of course we we won't be doing them. And... uh, so, so, and and football is not, you know, how, how when will we see Parkhead full again? We don't know. You know, yeah, this is um, so the other. So the other side of this is when when will people be able to get back together? And uh, we can watch games on the telly, like we've been watching some German football, and Portugal mm-hmm. has started again with some football. And it's great that people are playing again because for real, real fans, you've got something to watch again and talk about again. And we all need that stuff in our lives. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. But um, it's not the same without the fans there, is it? And that's when you understand, 
you know, the connection between the fan and the and, and the football, you know, itself. So much of what happens on the pitch is informed by the noise. And players always say, "Oh, we don't we we don't hear the the crowd." Nah, that's crap. You do. That, I agree with you. That energy, so you must get it on the stage. You know, I've watched some of your festival performances over the last couple of weeks, and you can tell that. Tim definitely buzzes off the energy from the crowd. And it must be the same for footballers. No, it must be. And, and uh, like, um, there are moments in games, you've, you've, you, you know, you've been in a stadium when you've seen it, when somebody does something mad, magical. And you know that it's because they, some, there's a surge of confidence. There's a moment. Somebody senses a moment. But it's all informed, I'm sure, by, you know, when you go to proper big football stadiums like Parkhead, you know, and it's full, you know, something happens. I mean, you know, it's, I, I was uh, fortunate to get tickets to uh, to the uh, 2011 Champions League final at Wembley, uh, mm-hmm. Barcelona Man U. And I took Vincent, my son, along to that. And, um, and I witnessed one of the greatest performances by a football team that I think is probably possible, you know, that 2011 team. And people like Xavi and Iniesta, uh, Messi was on the field, but he was great. But it, but really, the game was about Xavi and Iniesta. It was unbelievable. And Busquets to see them actually in front of you do this, and um, all the stranger to then a year later uh, to be at Parkhead when 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 Celtic beat them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the greatest team ever assembled. Perhaps, you know, as a club side, it's arguable that they were the, the great, the pinnacle of club football, that team. And uh, yeah, that, that was, that was like the kill, that was like the Killy experience, like tenfold, um, being in the stadium uh, when, when, yeah, when, when in that game, I, I, I yeah, we shuddered. We, we, it took about a week to recover. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and your your son's a Barcelona fan, and he was affected by it as well, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he kind of got that in a way from me because I moved to Barcelona in 1990, and I I I lost football in the 80s. Actually, it was so violent and it was so hardcore, and there was so much violence and racism and nastiness at games. By then, I was in Manchester and. Uh, you know, I went. I, I, I studied in Manchester, so I was in Manchester for the whole of the eighties, mm-hmm. and uh, and there was a lot of football. There was a lot of great football going on, but it was just too mental. And I got more and more and more into music, and uh, so I left football behind. But and I ended up, weirdly enough, moving to Barcelona in 1990. And um, my girlfriend's. Uh, Brother said, "Oh, I've got some tickets to go and see Barcelona play. Uh, I think it was PSV Eindhoven in a pre-season friendly." I was like, "I'm not interested. I don't want to go." And he goes, "No, no, you should, you should come. Come on, we'll, we'll go. It'd be really nice." I was like, "No, I'm not interested. I, I, I just, you know, I'm not interested." So I went, and I went into the new camp, and I just went, "Ah!" Oh. And it all came back to me. All those experiences, you know, uh, uh, through the seventies into the early 80s and it you know because my dad used to take me as well to, to Easter Road quite a bit so we used to go um, and see Hibs play it was easier to get to it was easier to get in all that kind of stuff and it had the sloping pitch as well which was really funny so <laughs> and, and, and I saw Stoich I saw Johan Cruyff who was my hero right as a boy growing up Johan Cruyff was my hero totally um, he was my footballing hero there were there were other players who were, you knew, were geniuses. You know, um, Celtic had one, Jimmy Johnson, obviously. You know what I mean? There were, there were, there were these figures around. Who were, but Cruyff, for some reason, I don't know. Well, I know where it came from. I went, actually, I, do, I know exactly where it came from. It came from 1976. We lived on a sheep farm near Stirling up in the hills, near Gargonach, actually. And my, I, I used to listen to the football in my bed through this mad little radio. It sounds like I'm making this shit up, but it, but it, and I listened to uh, the the Barcelona Liverpool match, which was the quarter final of the UEFA. Uh, what was the other? It wasn't the Cup Winners Cup, and it wasn't the European Cup. It was the other one. What was that called? Uh, whatever it was. Anyway, 
Was it the fair? Was it the fair city cup? No, no, it wasn't that. It was a proper. You know, it was that. That was kind of Mickey Mouse, wasn't it? Anyway, it was the whatever it was. So Liverpool went on to win it that year. That year they played Bruges in a two-legged final and they won it. Right. So uh, this was the quarter final, and uh, Liverpool beat Barcelona one nil at the New Camp. And I was listening to this. Now I was born in Liverpool, right? So. We were going to see a lot of football in Scotland, but I always had an eye on what was happening in Liverpool because it was like, you know, we lived far away. We had no car. In my family, we just had a motorbike. And, um, and so we couldn't all go on mo- the six of us in my family. You can't put six people on a motorbike and go to Oldham to go and visit your grannies. It's not going to happen. Right? Well, unless you do a relay, which imagine that. So um, <laughs> poor dad. He's like, right, I've got, I've got four of them down there. And it's just... <laughs> Um, so we, we, yeah, and I admired my dad for the next two weeks saying, take me to, to, to Anfield. I want to go and see the return game. I want to go and see, we didn't have any money really. We didn't have any way of going anywhere. Finally relented. He goes, okay, I'll take you. So we went overnight on his mad Honda 175, right? Overnight from Gargano to Anfield. And we got there in the morning, really early in the morning. We're standing outside Anfield, right? And I'm going, we need a ticket. How did we get a ticket? And it was these Spanish geezers there and they didn't want, and they said, um, you want, you want t- we got tickets. We got tickets in with the Spaniards, right? It was amazing. It was beautiful. That day we went to watch, we went to the cinema. We had nowhere to go. So we went to the cinema and watched like some mad disaster movie. I, th- I don't know, 75,000 leagues under the sea or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like whatever, mad. And went to the game and, and in with this, like probably about a thousand Spaniards. And, you know, I'd never seen a fur coat. I'd never smelled perfume. I'd never seen anybody smoke a cigar, do you know, like seriously, right? And that's what we were in the middle of. Mm-hmm. And I saw this geezer in the middle of the pitch and I thought, that guy is a true genius. And, I, and that was Cruyff. Naiskins was also in that team. They were an amazing team. Liverpool was great. It was, uh, you know, Ian St. John, I think, uh, Keegan, amazing, right? And from that moment, I just thought, he, he's the greatest player I'm ever going to see. I saw some amazing, I never saw Eusebio play, you know, I never saw Pele play, but I just thought he is on a different level, you know, like a different type of football, you know, not flash, like, okay, but he, he could be flash, but it was a different kind of football. And uh, I just thought he was special. When my son Vincent was born, I tried to get him named Johan Cruyff, right? Uh, but my now ex-wife, Anna, said, you're, you're not calling our son Johan Cruyff, that's just not happening. But recently I spoke to Vincent and I said, do you, what about changing name of Johan Cruyff? Because yeah, I might do it on deed poll, so I might have to start calling him Johan, which would be well, it'd be brilliant. <laughs> Cruyff was one of the most stylish players as well. So I don't know if you've ever heard the story that he almost signed for Dumbarton in the nineteen eighties. That's just not true. <laughs> he came and visited Boghead. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Can you imagine? I'll tell you what. Right, uh, I recently read his autobiography which was about five, six years ago, he put it out. Um, what gets me about him is, um, you, you you spoke to John Barnes yesterday, didn't you? I did, yes. So I think one of the things that uh, John Barnes has is class. You know? Like, obviously, an amazing footballer, icon on the pitch, but has an amazing intelligence and an amazing class about him. He's just a classy geezer, do you know what I mean? And uh, with some fiber to him really and some strength of character and uh uh and it's what i get from cruyff also you know a man driven in diff- in in a different way but nevertheless a man driven to make a difference uh and uh to introduce change to football um as i say in a different way uh, i guess cruyff changed the way that people even think about football and see football you know uh, as a game um, uh and he brought a philosophical edge maybe to the game, which, I mean, without, without that tutelage, you know, Guardiola wouldn't be, either, he wouldn't have been the player that he was and he certainly wouldn't have been the, the manager that, that he is, you know. Um, and, you know, I think Cruyff uh, changed everything in football. But he, it's interesting because he, he started, you know, uh, at the age of five working at the, uh, at the Ajax Amsterdam Arena, five, six years old doing stuff in the stadium because they lived right next to because he started obviously in Ajax and um, and then he was kind of 
taken under the wing of the groundsman there. So by the age of seven and eight, he described, describes at the age of eight being at one end of the ground at half time with the pick, you know, aerating the ground in front of the nutters at Ajax. He's seven years old. Like, amazing, eh? It's incredible. We're missing football, so as you say, it's not going to be the same probably until the start of next year. But we're also missing live music. But you're involved in setting something quite unique up that will allow people to tap into live events online. Could you tell us a wee bit more about that as well? Um, yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think I've been really fortunate, you know, like playing in the band that I do, having had the career that, I, that I've had. So... Um, as challenging as this period of time is for everybody who's not, you know, like I'm talking about the economics now of music really in a way. Um, but there's loads and loads of bands out there um, who, uh, if, if we don't, if, if we don't help them, if we, if we don't help each other, actually, um, we, we might end up losing some of those bands. And if we don't help, and if our industry doesn't help itself um, and coalesce around some positive ideas about how we move forward, um, and, and even if government doesn't help, actually, to an extent, then we might well find ourselves in difficulty because venues will close. People will move into other industries. Uh, it's really expensive to run those places, you know, and we need safe spaces for people to be able to play in and for people to be able to watch music in. So um, it's difficult. So um, I think we can see that loads and loads of our lives have migrated online in the last few months for obvious reason and um it, it maybe maybe we've made a huge leap maybe some of the things that people are now doing like this conversation that we're having online you know we might have had face to face maybe we'll have face to face again in the future but look how things have just seamlessly gone online people need to communicate people have got thoughts to share people have got activities to keep involved in and all the rest of it so i i personally think that music can be something that we can share online um, I think it's amazing that artists have felt compelled to uh, reach out to their audiences with, you know, doing what we call the lockdown tune thing. It's great. But um, my, my ambition is to, and, and we, we have created a platform um, in partnership with uh, some very clever driven people uh, in Portugal. who are also linked into people in America, in the West Coast of America, uh, in partnership with a uh, uh, quite a powerful online ticketing agency and um, and some other media partners who are giving us the space and the time again for free because they believe in what we're doing. And um, so, yeah, we've set up some live concerts, which are uh, those concerts thus far are, are, are about to start in, in Portugal. Um, our idea is to make sure that we can uh, ticket price very low um, so that because we think that accessibility to these events is really important. Not everybody can afford 50 or 60 quid to go to a gig. And so we think that charging somebody two or three or four quid to see still a beautiful and amazing online gig, really a show made by a band in a space, in a venue, but just with nobody in it, but filmed properly, recorded properly, mixed, put out live, um, is, is something that can be part of the way that our industry evolves and um, well, we, 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 we have, um, you know, we have partners in Scotland uh, now also. So um, which is what we're doing at the moment, building those relationships in Scotland and across the UK. We're starting in Portugal. We have a show on the 21st of June, uh, a Portuguese homegrown tan. Um, and uh, well, I'll, I'll, you know, we, uh, we've sold 15,000 tickets so far for that event. That's incredible. Yeah. And um, she's not a massive, massive, she's a, you know, she's known and whatever. That's been run by the, the partners in, in Portugal. And, uh, but we'll, we'll, we will start hopefully announcing artists from the UK that are going to come and get involved and start doing this. Um, we're still putting our partners in place, you know, and, and all the rest of it. But it's, um, we, and we, we think very strongly that, you know, accessibility, the sustainability of this model you know, my industry has been pretty bad, I think, at dealing with the targets around emissions and all the rest of it. And again, I'm not just paying lip service to this. You know, our industry is at the forefront of the creative industries. You know, mm -hmm. uh, more people come to see gigs than go to the theatre or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're, we're, it's massive. Yeah, it's the football of the arts, isn't it? Yeah, gigs. Yeah. You know, rock and roll, whatever, hip hop. You know, whatever. It's all, 
you know, there's, there's something there for everybody and everybody goes in big numbers. So music is vital to people's lives, you know, uh, and uh, so we need to keep it working, but we need to make it sustainable. We need to make it available to anybody. So people who are less able, you know, physically able to get to a gig, to get in a gig, to move around in a gig. You know, imagine you're a wheelchair band and you go to a big mad rock and roll gig, at the Hydro, say. Okay, they do their best and they do really well to cater for people who find themselves in difficulty. But it's, but it's, but why not have an amazing gig at home where you can share it with your mates? And it's costing almost nothing to do and it's banging. You know, so that's, that's what we're doing. And uh, I think uh, it's a way... It's a it's a it's a way that bands can monetize their work, um, but not by, you know, ripping people off. And I think it means that the audience can feel cool about spending a little bit on making sure that their bands can exist. And you know, and uh, well, you know, let's see. A lot of people are thinking, oh, well, by October we'll be doing gigs again. I personally don't think that will be the case. I don't think it will be the case that even next April or May that will be happening. I actually think that we'll only really see gigs again. Maybe we'll only see really the numbers of people back inside stadiums once there is a vaccine for COVID-19. And it's not good enough just to find a vaccine. You've also got to then give it to people. You've got to administer it to people and somebody's got to pay for it. So, you know, we're, we're a long way away, in my opinion, from the world going back to what people call the normal. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, we hear a lot about the new normal, like it's a thing that we all know what that is. But the fact is, it's the Wild West. We don't know what that is. You know, and, uh, you know, there's some very vulnerable people still in our communities who are susceptible to all sorts of things. And, you know, so people people need protecting still. So you've got to be seriously careful. You know what I mean? Really? Don't, yeah. You know. Where, where do we find the, the platform that you've set up? Because obviously we've got a gig coming up this month. Where, where can we find that and get involved? Um, it's You'll find it at cultureliveonline.com. Um, and uh, you'll see there, it's, a, it's kind of like a one-page introduction to this particular artist, Carolina Lisland, she's called. So this is a gig that's going on the 21st. She's a Portuguese artist. So for anybody Portuguese that might be seeing this, they'll know what she's singing about, which is great. And for anybody who doesn't, well, why not spend two euros and see what she's doing? I mean, why not? You might think it's brilliant. You might think, oh, I don't, I don't, it's not for me. Whatever, it doesn't really matter, in a sense. Do you know what I mean? But... Um, uh, and then I think what we're aiming to do is a very significant artist from Portugal, um, that Miguel and his guys over there, Miguel Bello is the guy that's put this together in Portugal. A very significant guy, a Portuguese artist uh, called Pedro Abanoza, who is probably kind of Portugal's second historically biggest ever artist who who, who signed up to to do a show on the 1st of, uh, of July, which is amazing. He's kind of like the Leonard Cohen of Portugal in a way kind of thing. He's... He, he's uh, uh, you know, he's quite a significant uh, cultural force in Portugal, and um, so no, it's, it's you know I think that you know, as we go on into the month and into August, September, uh, we hope to be able to bring some you know UK artists into this and uh, you know break down the barriers that exist between you know uh, you know our, our industry is very sophisticated and there's a lot of mouths to feed and there's a lot of uh, expectation about how our business should work, so we have to challenge. Um, the power structure and say to people uh, very gently, but very persuasively, but, um, you know, um, look, we, you know, you have to encourage our bands and our artists to engage with their public, whether it's in Peru or Portugal or Dunfermline or wherever it is, you know, I'm very proud of the start that we've made. And and at some point, maybe you'll, you'll have the opportunity, I'll have the opportunity to talk to you more about it and explain to people what we're doing when, you know, we've really built up our, uh, our artist roster and all the rest of it. And um, there's a there's a very fam- very well known American comedian called Bill Burr, for example. I think he's going to do uh, one from the LA side of things. So it's, this is not just about music. There's there's people, uh, dance companies from Holland, bands from France, all sorts of people who want to get involved, which is brilliant. You know, so you so it's it's well named Culture Live Online. It's not just rock and roll. Let's say mm. uh, there's some people from Angola. Uh, we 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 won't know very much about music from Angola, but there's a hip hop star from Angola. Lots and lots of people in Angola love him to bits. He's he's going to do one of these shows at some point coming through the summer. You know, again, some people might find it fascinating to watch a guy like that for an hour for almost for the cost of a coffee at Costa. You know, precisely. Yeah, yeah. You know why not? So, 
we need to find new and inventive ways of being able to generate income for musicians because, um, you know, without a music scene, a uh, vibrant music scene, without, a, without older people like me, more established artists, being able to also give a hand up to younger artists to come through, to be able to, you know, it's, it, you know, that, that will die, you know, and that, that isn't, that's not good enough. We can't allow that, you know, that to happen. And I have to say my particular interest is in Scotland in this case, because having been brought up a lot in Scotland, not exclusively, but a lot throughout my whole life, you know, and some of the people that I'm working with, I won't name them on this call, but some of the people that I'm working with, you know, are based in Scotland. And um, they, um, we are, are, are people that are huge supporters of, and, and, uh, of, the, of the Scottish music scene. And, and me and my band have uh, massively benefited from the support of Scotland. You know, James is massive in Scotland. I get that. Um, we connect with whatever it is in the Celtic gene, whatever. And uh, so, um, you know, those gigs that we do, wherever they be in Scotland, are always often the highlights of our tours. It's yeah. just the way it is. A lot of English bands say that, and I think the Scots always think, oh, they're just saying that to be nice to us. The reason they say it is because it's true. That's the point. You know, you know, there, there isn't a better venue, in my opinion, in the world than the Barrowlands. You know what I mean? That's that's just that's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. <laughs> it's great to hear that you, you know when it's a genuine compliment that you're making so because i think the scots love live entertainment they love to contribute to the event particularly at the barras so um to hear you saying that and you've traveled the world that's that's a real compliment but what i'd love to do so i would love to speak more in depth about this new platform once it's up and running and we could do an, an event like this again and speak about how people can get involved you know yeah no that'd be magic and and, and whenever that is you know because we're in, we're in contact now with artists across the uk but but a lot of them in scotland and um and, and um so next time i speak to you about it then there'll be an opportunity to actually confirm the artists who are going to work with us and um there'll be some artists there that are really emerging um and there'll be some that we all know you know and um mm-hmm. so for me the focus will be bringing and, and i would like nothing more than to see those bands that i love I, I continue to be able to reach uh, you know a worldwide audience i mean i've I, put this momentarily into perspective for you. Um, certainly this was the case very recently, if it's not exactly the case. I think it is. But Scotland, you know, we, we have four, under five million people living in Scotland, four and a half million people, inhabitants of Scotland, and we're the seventh biggest exporter of music in the world. That's pretty outrageous, really. Yeah. So when you talk about Scotland punching above its weight, I think that's where that's where you see it, you know. And uh, and it's part of an economy, and it's part of a, a, a state of mind. <laughs> it's part of a way of being, you know, that you represent your culture. You know, mm-hmm. um, you can dig up oil in the North Sea, but that doesn't represent your cu- culture. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't really mean anything. That doesn't say anything about who you are. You're just lucky because you got some oil. But for me, the cultural value in Scotland is immense, immense, and the history of rock and roll is shot through by artists who have emerged from Scotland. Um, you know, some of the most significant artists in the world have come from, from here. So I just, I think it's, it, we, so we need to, so we need to value that. We need to find a way to continue valuing that, you know, without, we don't just lie down and go, oh, well, we'll wait a couple of years. No, that's not good enough. That's, that, that's not what we're doing. You know, It's great to hear. And it's also great, everybody who's tuned in and listened to you tonight, please visit everybodybelongshere.com support the initiative, buy the t-shirt and watch the video of Many Faces because when you see how powerful that is and it may well be coming to a football stadium near you. Saul, I'd love to thank Seltzer here for hosting us tonight. I'd love to thank The Longest 40 for producing us tonight and of course yourself. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, just one last thing. Well, other than thanking everybody for putting this on, so I just want to say this. Our initiative actually is is really coming into focus. Everybody belongs here. We've got What we're going to do is we're going to talk to some some big businesses in the next week or two about helping us generate some little assets. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask supporters, clubs around the world, you know, literally around the world, to, when we're going to send them little packages of stuff that, that can go into stadiums, little, you know, the words, the, the emblem, the stuff, the, you know, it's, it's their physical representations of, 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 uh, of what we're doing. And, um, uh, and and we're going to try and engage with, uh, we will engage with the, the fans, the sports clubs, to go to the clubs that they love and demand of their clubs that, they, that those clubs take a very small but very significant step in supporting us by just putting, you know, this logo, I just, you know, that somewhere, 
in the stadium. Ideally, one chair. Give us one chair. You know, you, there's, I don't know, whatever there are. There's, you know, there's 95,000 chairs at the new Camp. Just give us one of them. And let's put that in it. Do you know what I mean? And it's big clubs. It's small clubs. Do you know what I mean? It's Sterling Albion. It's, you know, it's my local club, uh, Ross County. Do you know what I mean? You know, it, why not? Is it, and, it's, and it's youth football as well. You know, I just wanted right. to say this as well, the final thing about this. We always talk... You know, those of us who have kids and all the rest of it, we always talk about, um, you know, the next generation and all the rest of it, blah, blah. But I've been to some youth football events and my son played. Some, he's, he's a really good footballer and he, he plays some youth football and the rest of it. And the aggression and the anger that is often witnessed at the side of the pitch, whether it's towards opposing players, their own players, weirdly enough, or referees. I mean, the, the, the aggression that referees have to suffer is well documented at that level of the game. So we will approach also that sector of our the game that we love, you know, and say to them, listen, that, that's not really good enough. And th- so I just would like to finish by saying, you know, just if you think about those words, there's only one human race, many faces, everybody belongs here. That's something, that's a mantra that people need to, in my opinion, it can take on board and it can do some good. You know, it's not about my band. You know, I wish in a way we'd not written those words in a sense, actually. Because uh, I don't want to be challenged on whether we're doing it because I want something for my band. I don't. This is big, you know, this is big at the top end. You know, talking about Celtic here, you know, one of the biggest yeah. sporting institutions on the planet with an unbelievable history. But I'm talking about at grassroots as well, real, real, real grassroots level as well. It's our right. I think it's our right to be able to talk to people. But it's also our responsibility to talk to people. For you to come on and share that uh, with us tonight is appreciated because I think as a club and as a fan base, you know, I was speaking quite a bit uh, to John Barnes last night, like you say, all about the anti-racism message. And I think that is part of the state of mind of the Celtic fan base. So uh, this initiative for me, I think will fly and I think fans of Celtic and others will certainly get behind it. Brilliant. I hope they do. You know, there's some ama- there's great people out there and we all just need to get together and try and make a difference, really, I think. That's the point. Aye. So, yeah. And there is such a thing as a stealthic state of mind. I've, I've, I've been in it. <laughs> you have, so. And listen, thank you for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. It's been an absolutely enthralling evening and I, I must thank you for the bottom of my heart for coming along and speaking to us tonight. Brilliant. No, thanks very much. Brilliant. Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.